So the theme here is conscious planet. We're here to talk about making the planet more conscious. Does that mean saving the world or saving the individual? This idea that uh, world is lost, you or me have to save it, is a very cliched way of thinking. World is not lost, it flounders, it moves here and there, but it finds its way. How much floundering can you afford in a given generation? If you go too far, it'll become very messy. If you do less of floundering, that will be a good generation, people's experience of life will be good. Doesn't matter what we're doing, whether we're doing business, spirituality, sport, art, music, whatever. If you do it consciously, it will be of a better quality. If you do it unconsciously or accidentally, we will be unnecessarily anxious and we don't even enjoy our success. See, in human life, no matter what we do, whatever, small things, big things, the purpose of activity is success. But unfortunately, successful people on the planet carry a very stressed and miserable faces which is sending a wrong message to the next generation. In your family, let's say there are parents who are successful, but they're always stressed and anxious. You will see the children don't want that success. They would rather smoke pot. It's okay. happened again and again, because they wonder, what is the point of this? So it's very important that our success is a conscious process. Our way of thinking, emoting, and how we are and how we speak and what we do is a conscious process. Once it's conscious, if you are consciously crafting your experience of life right now, would you make yourself blissful or miserable? What's blissful. the choice? Blissful. blissful, absolutely. This is the same choice for everybody. Everybody consciously, they want the highest level of pleasantness within themselves. Sometimes they may… what they want for their neighbors may be debatable, but <laughs> what they want for themselves is always the highest level of pleasantness. Why such a simple thing is not happening? Because people have not learned how to conduct their own thought and emotion, which is most fundamental. It is… it's like if your face starts smashing you in the face… if your hand starts smashing, uh, smashing you in the face, that would be a serious ailment. If your thought or emotion starts smashing you up from inside, how better is it? You can call it stress, anxiety, this, that, it seems there are seventy-two names for various types of mental ailments. But essentially, your intelligence has turned against you. You do not know how to conduct this human mind consciously, which is the greatest miracle. But for a large number of people, mind is a misery manufacturing machine. So whether you make a miracle out of it or misery out of it depends on whether you conduct yourself consciously or unconsciously. So how does one control this mind consciously or is that not even possible? No, I'm not talking about controlling, I'm talking about liberating mm -hmm. the mind. Why should you control the mind? You must liberate the mind. Right now, the fear of suffering makes people control everything. Why is it people are always controlling their lives? The fear of suffering, isn't it? Where is the suffering manufactured? In what do you mind. think? In, the in mind. your mind, right? Yeah. It's definitely not in SFO <laughs> because she was asking you those questions. <laughs> so, uh, misery is manufactured in your mind. Why is your mind creating misery for you? Obviously, you have a brain, but you don't have a keyboard. You just… something is happening accidentally. To create inner experience, we are trying to manage the entire outside situation. Let me put it this way. If your body becomes pleasant, we call this health. You want it? Mm -hmm. Health? Health, yes, of course. Health? Everybody. Hello? Yeah. You say yes, no, silence, I'm going to bless you. Health? Yes, please say yes, a big yes within yourself because most people have not said yes to health, absolutely. 
Ah, when they're sick, they go to the doctor, they do all those things. But in their day-to-day life, how they sit, how they breathe, how they eat, what they do, they have not said yes to it. I'm asking you, are you a big yes to health? Yes. Because everything else depends on that. If this becomes… if this body becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. Yeah. I hear a big yes there <laughs> If this mind becomes pleasant, we call it peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. If this… if these emotions become pleasant, we call it love. If this becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. If these very life energies become pleasant, we call this blissfulness. If this becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If your surroundings become pleasant, we call it success. Only to make your surroundings pleasant, you need the cooperation of people and forces around you. To make your body pleasant, mind pleasant, emotions pleasant, energies pleasant, it's one hundred percent your business. If you've not done that business properly, then doesn't matter what you do in the world. If you don't know how to be, that is when you become desperate in your doing. And the world, today we're meeting for COP28, the world is being destroyed in pursuit of human happiness and well-being. It's not some evil people destroying the planet. It's all of us in pursuit of happiness. I'm asking you a simple question. Whether you experience joy or misery, did it happen within you or outside of you? Within? Within? So this is the case, there was a potato… there was a potato farmer, can I tell you? He was in California. Okay. <laughs> there was a potato farmer. One day he wanted to eat apples. So he went in search of an apple tree, found one. But out of sheer habit, started digging for the apples. He's a potato farmer. He dug so hard, he didn't get anything. He became furious and dug harder, harder. The tree came down upon him. This is our story right now. Mm -hmm. In search of human happiness, we're digging up the world. Whether you want joy or misery, you can only find it within yourself. It is not even finding. You manufacture joy, you manufacture misery within yourself. If you are conscious, you would definitely manufacture joy. Because it's happening accidentally, all sorts of things are happening. So how do we find this inner joy and peace that you speak of? Is it the science of yoga? See, the word yoga, in, especially in California… Yeah, it's a workout in California, it's uh, <laughs> calisthenics. <laughs> but you've talked about jnana yoga, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, kriya yoga, you know, there's raja yoga, there's so many forms of yoga. Yeah, let me come to this. See, unfortunately, yoga means uh, today because it's a rebound from the American coast. So uh, people think yoga means you must look like a leftover noodle. So yoga is not about twisting and turning. The word yoga means union. What does union mean? Today modern science is telling you this in many ways. Right from a long time, religions of the world trying to tell you the same thing. Today modern science is telling you the whole existence is one energy manifesting in million different ways. Modern science, I mean the religions of the world have been screaming for a long time, God is everywhere. They're not two different realities, just one is approaching emotionally in a certain way, another is approaching in a logic… logical, proper way, I know, another way of looking at it. Essentially, you are saying, what is here and what is there are not different. If this becomes your living experience, then we say you're in yoga. For example, what you exhale, the tree is inhaling. What the tree exhales, you are inhaling. Suppose you actually experience this, that you realize one part of your lungs is actually hanging out there, which is a fact. If all of us experience this, do we need COP28, I'm asking? Do we need COP? We would have done what is needed. We don't experience that. Everybody thinks they are a world by themselves. See, in this room, whatever number of people are there, they are not living in the same world. Each one of them are living in their own world. What do you think? It's reality or a it's hallucination? Un un undivided. Huh? Reality is undivided. So, in, if you experience this, that if you sit here, 
you see everything as part of yourself, not mentally, not intellectually, not emotionally, experientially. For example, whatever you ate for lunch today, that whatever you ate didn't look like you, didn't smell like you, didn't feel like you, but now it's become you in a few hours. Yes? Yes. If you ate an apple, it's… apple has become a human being now. So, something that's not you has become you. This is the reality all the time. But right now you think, this is me. So this experience of individuality is a privilege, is a… is the magnanim magnanimity of creation that's been showered upon us. <laughs> we took it too seriously. We, th we thought my individuality is absolute. Probably most people won't get it till you bury them. Right now you… you can think you and the soil that you walk upon are different. But when you and me are buried someday, you much later, me sooner, uh, okay? Never know. <laughs> <laughs> so when we are buried someday, we will become part of the soil effortlessly, isn't it? Yeah. Even now we are, but that's not in our living experience. This is the human problem. So consciousness means this, this, that you become conscious about the nature of your existence. Once you're conscious about the nature of your existence, you know how to be. See, we are the only creatures on the planet who are referred to as beings. We don't call a tiger a tiger being, a camel a camel being or anything a being. They are creatures because they live within two lines. According to whatever nature has set within themselves, they live like that. We have the ability to be whichever way we want to be. But how many people know how to be if they knew what is the problem? So only if you know how to be, then your doing becomes a conscious expression of who you are. Because we don't know how to be, doing becomes compulsive. In this compulsiveness, because your being is not significant enough, now you want to leave a footprint on the world. But those who leave footprints will… you know, those who want to leave footprints shall never fly in their life. So. Earlier the word mindfulness was mentioned, you've talked about consciousness, we've talked about being. What is an individual to do? Everyone here is stressed, hurried, they have lots of things to do, their iPhone is always buzzing, <laughs> lots to achieve. Would they what, be… What little change can they make? Would they, be, would they be very happy if they had nothing to do? No. Then what's their problem? <laughs> so then being and doing, is it just the recognition that whatever you're doing is fine? What… what I'm saying is, if you know how to be, you will do what is needed. In a given situation, what is needed, you will do your best. Different people according to their capacities will do different levels of activity, it's fine. But right now, the only way you can be somebody is by doing all kinds of things. Because you don't know how to be, if you do something small, you're stressed, if you do something big, you're stressed. Whichever way you're stressed, just tell me one thing that people are not stressed about. Just about anything. If they're poor, they're stressed of their poverty. If you make them rich, they're stressed about the taxes. If you… if they're not educated, they're stressed about that. Put them into school, endless stress. They're not married, they're stressed. Get them married <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> I didn't even say anything <laughs> <laughs> This is the truth. <laughs> so this goes on. So the problem is, we have not learned how to hold the faculties that we hold within ourselves. What is it that people are suffering? Just look at this. They think they're suffering life. No, life is not happening much. What they're suffering is, what happened ten years ago, they can still suffer. What may happen day after tomorrow, they already suffer. What is this? They're essentially suffering two fantastic qualities that… that is exclusive for human beings, a vivid sense of memory and a fantastic sense of imagination. These are two things which set you apart from every other creature and that's what you suffer. This memory is fantastic, this is what makes our life rich. This imagination is the basis of everything that we create in the world, but this is what human beings suffer. They… what happened yesterday, they suffer means what? They're suffering their memory. What may happen tomorrow if they're suffering, what does it mean? They're suffering their imagination. Life is yet to happen because 
people have misunderstood their psychological phenomena as existential. Your psychological phenomena is your psychological drama. It's for you to direct it well, but you start thinking it's real. Your thought and emotion is your making. It's not a real thing. You can make it any way you want. But because you do not know how to... or rather let us put it, because you're a technology guy, you have a brain, but you don't have the keyboard, so you keep punching it like this, <laughs> something happens accidentally. So how does one free themselves? There is a whole science and technology. As there is a science and technology for external well-being, there is a whole science and technology for inner well-being. Well, I call this inner engineering. There are many simple ways to do this. If you are willing to invest fifteen minutes a day, you can bring about a phenomenal change. Today, there are lots of studies in the Harvard Med uh, Medical School, in the Beth Israel Hospital, in the Rutgers University, in the California University, Indiana University, they made a lot of studies on what we are doing with people. And they are saying, I'm, I'm just putting… Uh, considering the time, putting this in simplistic terms, they are saying that in six weeks of practice, of something like fifteen to twenty minute practice, your endocannabinoids in the body have risen by seventy percent. This is higher than what happens in extreme exercise or even in a sexual orgasm. It's even higher than that. Simply sitting here, you're blissed out. If you're blissed out within yourself, you wouldn't do anything compulsive. You will do what is needed and joyfully. That's what we need to create. If you can be happy by yourself, then you can project that to the world. You don't need anything. Yes, and uh, shall I tell you my problems? Yes. <laughs> Don't this is forty years ago. I was sitting on a small hill in southern India and suddenly I did not know which is me, which is not me. Till that time I was fine, I was in business, running various things. I thought, uh, you know, when you're successful, when you're just twenty-two, twenty-three years of age, when you're very successful with what you're doing, you don't slowly start thinking the planet is going around you, not around the sun. Everybody is clapping their hands, you're a great success and da-da-da, your mother is there. <laughs> you know, my mother also clapping her hands. So you think world is actually revolving around you. So when I'm in this kind of very confident and <laughs> fine doing what I'm doing, one afternoon I'm sitting, till that point I thought, this is me, that is somebody else. I got no issues with that somebody, but this is me, that is somebody. Suddenly I did not know which is me, which is not me. I thought my experience became like I'm everywhere. I grew up to be a super skeptic, so skeptical. By the time I'm ten, eleven, I'm a hardcore atheist. By the time I'm thirteen, fourteen, I'm actively involved in the communist movement in the country. So I'm not somebody who is used to any this kind of stuff. So, I thought this happened for ten, twenty minutes. When I came back to my normal senses, it was a four and a half hours. For the first time in my adult life, tears were flowing. Me and tears were impossible. My shirt is all wet. Then I shake my skeptical head and what is happening to me? The only thing that my mind can tell me is maybe I'm going off my rocker. Then I ask my closest friends, what do you think is happening to me? Something… something fantastic, if I close my eyes, I'm blown away. What is this? They say, come on, what did you drink? What did you pop? Did you find mushrooms in the hill? <laughs> uh, this is all they could <coughs> tell me, there was no context. Then I kind of stabilized my, myself in about six weeks. If I close my eyes, I think it's two minutes, seven, eight hours gone, boom. I'm… just every cell in my body is dripping ecstasy. Then I thought I've hit a gold mine and then I realized, what is it? If I just create a little distance between me and my physiological process and my psychological process, once there is a distance between myself and my body, myself and my mind, that's it, I'm blown away. I thought, I have discovered this and I will do it to the whole world. I sat down and made a plan on that day, the world's population was 4.92 or something. I made a plan, in two and a half years' time, I will make the whole world blissful. Look at me, forty years later. 
still uh, I have people say we have touched over two billion people now, but that's not my idea of the world, 8.4 billion people. So I am destined to die a failure, but a blissful failure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>